when you realize you can do something that not only makes you feel really good, like your, you know, boosts your your mental and your physical health, but also that you you overcome, you know, the part of you that just wants to pull the covers over your head. Um, you get so you get so used to it, and it just becomes this this way of life. Hey, welcome to Sauna Culture. This is the show all about the design, science, wellness practice, and culture around sauna. In it, you're going to hear stories of people's lives being transformed by this practice all over the world. Hi, my name is Justin Juttonen, the host of the show, here as always with our co-host and producer, Sarah Olson. Hey, Sarah. Hello. How are we doing? We are well. And you know how life can be sort of stressful? No. What do you mean? What do you mean? I mean, well, I have a couple of kiddos at home. Oh, okay. Work is full. Yeah. Uh, the world lately. Mm, yeah. Now that you mention it. Bits of yeah. stress. Yeah. And in it today, you are going to hear from Katya Panzer. And Katya is this amazing author from Finland who is telling these wonderful stories of how we get through that stress. Yeah. Sarah, as you listen to this conversation, as you went through it, what were some of those things that folks are going to hear? I, I mean, Kati is just brilliant. And I think just to see a woman who's a thought leader in this space and um, just talking about hard things that are, are kind of hard to talk about, mm -hmm. um, but in, in this beautiful way and vulnerable way and to invite all of us into that space where we're, we're working through all of those hard things together. It's beautiful. Totally really beautiful. So if you are into cold plunging and winter swimming, if you are into sauna and heat therapy, mm -hmm. if you are just somebody who has a little bit of stress in your life, yeah. this conversation is for you. Uh, our dear friend and author of The Finnish Way and Everyday Sisu, Katya Panzer. You're going to love this conversation. Here we go. Katya, thanks so much for being on Sauna Culture with us. It is it is truly an honor to have somebody who I've read lots of your work and now get to speak with you today. Uh, how are things in your part of the world? Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Uh, I think things are are relatively good given the world situation that has most of us, I think, quite worried, and uh, a few other things like the pandemic, which we've experienced again, globally, but also locally. My son and I are just getting over Corona. So uh, we're getting back into shape. And so like talk about, you know, we're, part of our conversation today is really going to be about resilience and that, that you're like literally in the moment of that, right? You're recovering from what I think maybe the, the last two years sort of feels like a decade. Um, yeah. And then in the very like recent feeling of it, you guys are just hit by it. So Thanks for being with us. We'll we'll give as much energy as we can. And if you need a break or coffee or, you know, go take a nap during the podcast, we can do that. Uh, I want to I want to say for folks who don't know uh, Katya's work, it's really wonderful. Um, there's a couple different works. One's your new one that's out, but also your old one. I need to show it to you here. The Finnish way. Uh, 22 different languages This has been published in. But my copy, it's like <laughs> it's used and full of coffee stains and, um, you know, like scribbled in. And so to me, it's been such a good example of really culture and your story and all these things that we're promoting here uh, in North America. And you're really telling it. And so, you know, today on, on the show, I'd love to just unpack resilience, but also your story of being a writer. And then, of course, get into your new one that just came out this week, Everyday Sisu. So um, Katya, as we sort of dive in, for folks who don't know you, um, I would love to hear just kind of, why are you writing about these cultural elements, these textures? Tell us about what spurred you on to that. That's a really good question. Um, essentially, I would, to try and keep the answer somewhat brief, um, I grew up in North America, um, predominantly on the west coast of Canada, 
but I also lived in Toronto for many years, and I've lived other in other parts of the world, like the UK and New Zealand. And I have Finnish roots, so I had this part of me that always wondered what that meant, and I got very interested in it, and I thought I knew what it meant, but I didn't really know what it meant until I got a job. I took a job uh, many, many years ago in Finland, working as an editor and a writer for an English language in-flight magazine. And I got to travel the world and learn about the world and about Finland. And what happened along the way, I only intended, I, at the time when I took the position, I was living in Toronto, and I thought I'll just go for a year or two and live in Europe and get to know about my, my cultural roots, pick up some more Finnish, that kind of thing. And what totally surprised me was that I completely ended up falling in love with the lifestyle, um, the really practical, pared down Nordic lifestyle. And uh, things that previously had been foreign to me, let's say things I didn't appreciate, like cold weather, um, became my friend. Things like sauna, which I had not really understood or cared for, um, became almost addictions, but healthy addictions. And that was part of the journey um, of how I discovered these things. And I guess as a journalist and a I had done a lot of travel writing, so my job was to go to new places and, you know, explain Japan or explain Indian, you know, Bollywood, explain, you know, whatever the issue was. And I quickly gravitated towards well-being and health issues and societal ones. I was less interested in, you know, luxury five-star hotels and that kind of thing. And so it was really a natural progression of my lifelong dream to write books that would help people and for an international audience. And then bringing out this fabulous story that just kept unfolding, which there are not that many books that have been written in English about Finland and Finnish culture. So it was really, uh, I would say, a lot of factors coming together at the right time and in the right place and a passion. I I love that. I love this idea that it sort of took you becoming a in-flight travel writer to sort of <laughs> research the heritage and the background. Um, we see things so much clearer when we're looking back on them when we're not in them. Um, and I feel that a lot as somebody who's sort of grown up with uh, Finnish American heritage, grown mm -hmm. up with sort of some of these values in it, and also sort of have lots of connections and friends in Finland, then you sort of, when you're there and you talk to Finnish people, it's so normal, right? The, yeah. These sorts of things, which for some people sound crazy, are just, they're in the water, right? Have you encouraged, or have you seen that like along the way where it's just so normal in Finland and Helsinki to go jump in cold water or to go in the sauna? Yeah, I think, and I think that was part of what I, I think one important part of the puzzle was that I had always felt the, the sort of financial inequality in North America. And I, I don't mean by that, um, I mean, I had, I was very privileged and I've had all kinds of opportunities for education, for other things. But, you know, this feeling that if you were wealthy, you had so many more opportunities for education, for well being, for health, for where you lived and how that would affect, you know, if you lived in the right neighborhood, you could go to the right school, meet the right people. And, it felt to me in some places in North America that the cards were really stacked against you before you even started. So it was much harder, even if you were really talented and gifted as a small child, you know, if your parents didn't have connections and money and access, um, you would have a harder time getting ahead. And by getting ahead, I mean, realizing your own dreams and taking care of yourself and living a healthy life. And what one of the things I really fell in love with in Finland, it was this real true sense of equality. Like when you're sitting in the sauna, it doesn't matter if somebody's a president or a cleaner or, you know, the head of a large, large corporation. You know, it doesn't matter if you've arrived in a BMW or on an old beat up bicycle. You sit in the sauna and you are human beings who, you know, talk about world events or issues, you know, relax, have a good steam. And that kind of equality, but also that it's 
it's open to everybody and accessible to everybody really spoke to me. And at the same time, I realized a lot of my own uh, difficulties, for example, struggling with depression and some other things were very much lifestyle related. And that the more I exercised and the more that I rode my bike to work and, you know, went for took up winter swimming, you know, the better I felt. And it was just so simple and it was so easy because there are winter swimming spots everywhere and there are saunas everywhere. And I didn't need to have a fancy outfit or an expensive gym membership. So I think that that I found that really liberating. And it was like this story that I wanted to tell. Katya, I love that idea that there is just the sauna is this space of equity right? That everybody sort of has a place there. Um, one phrase I talk about a lot here to North Americans is this old Finnish proverb that says the, there is nowhere more, or all people are created equal, but nowhere more so than in the sauna. And that idea is absolutely what you're talking about. It's a space for health, wellness, and hey, everybody come on in, be a part of this. It isn't luxury and opulence. And in a world that we're in right now, which is difficult, we need spaces like that, don't we? I, I think I totally agree with you. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, part of it is too this, um, there's growing inequality on so many levels. And I think any space where people come together and they're accepted as they are, and they come from all backgrounds, I think is a great space because I think it's not just about accepting everyone. It's also about the fact that uh, if you don't talk to people who are not in your group, you can have a very narrow view of the world. You know, you understand less uh, about other people and about circumstances and all kinds of things. Uh, for example, if you belong, let's say, to a, an expensive tennis club and all the people that you socialize with are from the same socioeconomic background and they all have the same budget to spend on the same labels and a certain lifestyle, then it becomes harder, I think, if you don't have contact with people from other circumstances and backgrounds to understand and to have a, a sort of, I guess, a broader outlook on life and more understanding and compassion about the many very, very different ways that we live. I, I think that's such a good introduction to sort of some of your work because, you know, The, the Finnish Way, your, your first book, uh, it is really this sort of your story of un discovering these kinds of things. How do we create more equity? How do we create more resilience? How do we create these practices in our life that work well for us individually amidst long, cold winters and difficult days and years? And also, how do we do that socially and connected? Um, I'd love to talk about this new one. I'd love to dive in just for a minute here. Uh, I was so sure. excited. This arrived this week. Uh, this is Everyday Sisu, tapping into Finnish fortitude for a happier, more resilient life. And uh, it's this little red book that to me has a whole bunch of wisdom in it. For somebody who doesn't know, what is this word sisu? Can you help define that to begin with? Essentially, sisu is a unique type of fortitude in the face of challenges, small and big. So really it's about, um, what I like to say is, first off, I should say that it's a, it's a term that dates back five, 600 years. And there are some very hardcore historic examples that have to do with wartime defeats or keeping uh, enemies at bay, uh, Olympic victories, those sorts of things. But, but really, everyday Sisu is really um, gathering up the courage to face life's challenges head on, whatever they may be. So it can be work, it can be relationships, it can be your own health and well-being. Um, what I like to say is that, for example, I use winter swimming as, as a good example, which for those people who are not familiar with it is essentially going swimming in very cold water in the winter. It is time, as advertised, uh, either in the sea right? Or a lake. <laughs> yes. It's like one degree Celsius. It's, you know, often a hole is made in the ice. I mean, that's how cold it is that 
you need to break the ice to get to the water. And swimming is, is a good term, but really for a lot of people, it's more of a dip. You know, it's a minute or two in cold water. But that, uh, to me, is a really excellent idea, an example of sisu, because in Finland, we have a long, cold winter. And so instead of sitting around and complaining because it's not cocktail beach weather and being frustrated by that, it's like, hey, let's embrace the cold. Let's make it work for us. And winter swimming, of course, uh, has many health benefits, uh, both mental and physical, because it sets off all the endorphins, it gets the blood rushing, the heart pumping. Uh, so it's this very positive activity that you can do that is quite time efficient, you know, if you think that you're dipping for, say, one or two minutes and then changing, or ideally having a nice sauna afterwards, and then you can alternate hot and cold. So really, Sisu, uh, is, it's about finding your own courage and grit to deal with whatever in your life, the big things and the little things, uh, and figuring out a way to, A, make them work for you, but also turn them around so that you look for a solution rather than, oh, just I'm going to give up or forget this or hate that. It's like, no, okay. How do we how do we try to fix this? How do we try to come up with a better way to deal with this, whatever the challenge is? That's it's it's so good and it's so needed, right? In in the face of life, which when we look at it honestly, there's a lot of difficulty. You need this sisu. You need these inner reserves of grit and perseverance. I I've often heard the most poetic definition of sisu is the ability to make it through a long winter. And for folks who live in Minnesota, yeah. like me, or in Finland, or in you know Canada and northern climates, that's a it's a marathon sometimes to get through, and we need to find these ways to do it. So I absolutely love it. I love your storytelling on it. Um, one thing that struck me about the new book is how honest you are and vulnerable <laughs> you are, even like right out the gate. You mm -hmm. know, so let me if I could. I, I want to read like a paragraph here because it ties right into this winter swimming. So you just, you kick off, you're talking about dipping into the Baltic outside of Helsinki and you say, this day's dip into the sea was really just a dip as I'm not a very good swimmer. But this simple morning routine has become one of the activities that make up part of my lifeline. The fact that I was able to get myself to the dock an easy five minute walk from home go for a dip and talk with friends is a little is little short of a miracle or at least a 180 degree turnaround for less than two months earlier i was in a very different place i was recovering from a serious depressive episode a burnout that left me so depleted that the mere idea of this morning's activity would have seemed impossible so as you think about that katya when you when you hear that when you see those words why Why go so deeply into that honest moment about those months of difficulty as you kick off a book for people? Yeah, well, I, th I think essentially I, I neglected to follow my own advice, which was to take care, you know, put on your own put on your own oxygen mask before you start putting on other people's oxygen masks and, you know, doing those very, the things that sustain me, which is, you know, going for the dip every morning and making sure that I take care of my physical and mental health and, you know, get enough rest and exercise and eat properly. And then also there were a great many challenges work-wise and family-wise that all happened in a very short space of time. And I just, I know that I have gotten so much from people telling their stories and their vulnerabilities. And I admire them so much more for saying, this is, you know, authentically, this is really what happened, not well. And then we, you know, we purchased the third home and then, you know, I won the Nobel Prize and everything is fabulous, you know, because you know that that is just not the reality of life for just about anybody. Totally agree. Now, for folks who, you know, and I want them to get the book. So, y'all, we need to, we're going to go do that. We're going to put <laughs> links in the show notes, all those things. But give folks then that, that sort of step by step of how do they do that? How do they put 
their own oxygen mask on? How do they put these practices that you suggest? Because you really sort of lay out a bit of a, a guidebook on here's yeah. some things. You might want to try on a few of these habits. You might want to start going and jumping in cold water. You might want to start, you know, getting into nature more. Uh, give, us, give us some of those points for folks that as they are going to start into the book, what do you need to do to make that happen? I think it's really, really important to take care of your own um, well-being. And, and there is no one formula. Everyone is individual and unique. So you need to know what it means for you. For someone, that might mean, you know, walking just half a kilometer every day, getting 15 minutes of fresh air and, you know, change of scenery. For someone else, that means they're training for a marathon and, you know, going to a gym. Um, but I think what is universal is, is, and there's a lot of research that backs this up as well, is, is having some sort of a connection with nature, uh, going offline, having a digital detox, you know, for a, a short amount of time during the day. So going to a nearby park, walking in the woods, swimming in the sea, uh, whatever that might be where you live and what is uh, I think also easy for you. If you need to drive somewhere for five hours, it's going to be very hard to incorporate it into your daily or weekly life. Um, if there's something that you can do every day or every second day, that's going to make it much easier to continue. For example, I don't think I would be able to winter swim if I didn't have several docks that are within uh, about a five minute walk from where I live. Um, so that would, you know, be something that would slow down or limit how much time I spent on that activity. I think the other thing is to really look at what you consume um, and what your, what your impact on the world is. Um, just like, you know, sometimes people who are in a very bad mood and they go around saying horrible things to people wonder why they meet so many grumpy people. It's like, well, you know, what you put out there comes back. And I think it's the same thing for when you, you know, if you start to examine the way that you live um, from a sustainability and from other points of view, um, are you contributing to trying to make the world a better place, a greener place um, or not? And those are choices that everybody has to make themselves. And there isn't one universal formula but I think when you become more socially aware of taking care of the planet and taking care of other people, um, you feel better. Uh, you have a sense of purpose. And this is about community, about belonging. And so many people I know who do a variety of things will often say, oh, well, that thing, I just... I get so much out of helping. So, you know, I don't need to be paid for that or I don't need to, you know, this is something I just do because it's important. And I think that's something that's very important to think about is, is those things that restore us, whatever they may be, which also uh, outside of we all have to earn a living and we have bills to pay and things like that. But there are things that you can do for passion and things, um, you know, a sense of purpose, uh, something that is, you know, whether it's something that has to do with recycling or, you know, helping children who need help or seniors who need help or something even small um, can really turn a cynical person around. Yeah, we, we need we need purpose, right? We need mission. We need to mm -hmm. believe in the things we're doing that they have meaning in the world, right? And so... Yeah. I, I love that there's not this one size fits all uh, sort of suggestion for, hey, this is a quick fix self-help book. I, I don't see it as that. I see this as a, in many ways, sort of a toolbox of, hey, these might be some things that you might want to use this tool. Uh, you maybe have never thought about this as a tool that could help. Or here's one that's just, you know, really easy. I want to, of course, here we are on Sound of Culture, the podcast. I want to dive into two of those. <laughs> Uh, I do yeah. want to I want to dive in a little bit to the cold water with you. So we, we've we've mm -hmm. talked about it a little bit, and then I of course want to talk about sauna. Um, mm -hmm. So it, give us paint us that picture a little bit. You know you have a you have a dock somewhere near that mm -hmm. most days you walk down to in the morning. 
And when we say most days, the Baltic Sea is not, you know, I, I live in North America. There's Lake Superior right out here. It is cold every mm-hmm. day of the year, right? And the Baltic is sort of a similar version of that. This isn't a warm water tropical beach. Tell us about jumping in the water most days. How does that happen? Why do you do it? What have you seen from it? Yeah. Well, essentially what happened was I initially tried it for a story and just thought, you know, this is a one-off, like you have to try everything as a journalist and as a, as a curious human being who's interested in, you know, stories and people and cultures and things like that. And then my great surprise was I got completely hooked on it because what happens after the initial shock, I mean, the water is about one to five degrees Celsius in the wintertime. Um, after the initial shock, you just feel amazing. You have this sense of feeling as though you're invincible. You have what's called a swimmer's high because it's like shock therapy. It's a total you drug. It, it's just euphoria. Exactly. You get this. And it's for folks euphoria. who don't know, I mean, it is, it, is hard to, it is hard to find in other ways that are so healthy, right? Like. <laughs> Yeah, and so quick because you yeah. you dip in and you dip out, and and especially if you have a natural body of water. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. You don't have to you know book a slot at the local you know gym cryotherapy pool or anything like that. And what happens is you, uh, for me at least, I realized um, that I could really manage how I feel, and I know a lot of. Uh, <clears throat> Other swimmers do this as well. If you're feeling tired or stressed or you have some aches and pains, it's like, okay, I'll, this is my pharmacy. I'll go for a dip and then I will reassess, you know, whatever the thing that was bothering me, it will seem like, okay, after the, the cold dip, it'll be like, wait a minute, what was I so concerned about? You know, or I'll figure it out. It's okay because the cold water also stops you and you have to be in the moment and you know you're dealing with not only yourself but with the water with the air with the with nature you're present and suddenly your problems seem much smaller but also because of the the physiological effects of the cold water you also um, feel you know this sense of calm although you do feel the endorphins kick in you feel kind of happy and and euphoric at the same time Um, But you also, let's say if you have an ache or a pain or something like that, that you leave it all in the sea. So we often, uh, I often say that, uh, for example, to my son, like, okay, I'm just going to go and, and, and have a dip, you know, and I'll be a little bit more pleasant after that. Like if there's some kind of an issue or something, or if I have had a really stressful day at work, um, I go every morning. I've basically... I'm so addicted to it that I don't really wake up properly if I don't go for my morning dip um, to start my day. But I will also sometimes go another time, you know, in the afternoon or the evening if I've had a really stressful day or if I'm feeling really low energy and then I know other than or actually better than a cup of coffee will be a dip in the sea. And it's just the factory settings are restored. I'm re-energized. I'm recharged. I've left all of the things that were ailing mind and body in the sea, and I'm ready to go. So for folks who need good parenting advice on the moments where (laughs) those moments where, you know, your kids sort of bring you to the end of yourself or you don't have enough patience, that is the good reset button. Uh, Parents out there, I think we all know that. And I think, you know, when I hear you talk about it and it's accessible and it's this, it isn't just... um, a recovery from wellness challenge, though it is, right? I see a lot of people yeah. entering into cold plunging, winter swimming through this, I, this idea and lens of I work my body out, I challenge my body, and I recover my yeah. muscles. You're also coming to it from this cultural lens of resiliency and building a, a, a mental health routine. Am I right in that? There's sort of both things happening yeah. at the same time? Definitely. And I would say it's like resiliency training, because I know if I don't go for a dip, I'm going to be less equipped to deal with the stressors of the day, you know, less energetic, less focused. 
And so I think it's really definitely, it's a way that I maintain my well-being, my mental and physical health. But there's also the, the added beauty of it is, and something that really, really has come up during the last two years where, you know, so many gyms have been shuttered and people have had a harder time doing whatever they used to do before the pandemic for their physical and mental well-being, i.e. going somewhere where there's other people and doing an activity together, whether it's yoga or whatever, is with winter swimming because we're, there is a changing room where I go. Um, and, and there's a sauna as well, but um, we're predominantly outside. So it was social at a time when you couldn't see other people. And it was almost like group therapy because you had that five minutes of chatting with a fellow swimmer about, you know, what was the latest in world politics? Or did you see that, that news item? Or, you know, how do we feel about this, that, or the other thing? Or somebody just has, you know, a personal issue that they want to share, you know, oh, this terrible thing happened or does somebody have advice on this or you know even the big right now the big topic is should Finland join NATO there are people standing in their swimming suits on the dock many mornings a week having a, a very heated debate about this topic because you've been for your dip and you're energized and you want to deal with things but also you want to hear what other people have to say and so that community aspect, the same way that sauna brings people together, um, there's a real community, you know, other people, other points of view and support. How are you? You know, some people don't even get asked, how are you very many times a day if they're working from home um, for whatever reason uh, during the last two years, that's been very common. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot this... of things are being delivered. There's this yeah. fight on isolation, right? This, this yeah, we can do yeah. this and we can do it together. And I, I watch it happen so yeah. often, especially for new folks who have never done any type of hot or cold therapy. They, yeah. they think they're going to die. They're just like, there is yeah. no way <laughs> this is an impossible task. And then they watch one other person do it. And that other person does great. You know, they, they're like, oh, that was, yeah. you know that was exciting or that was fun or maybe they're a pro and they go in there and they're like, oh, this is great. And they come out and it gives them this little shred of hope. Well, wait, they're not crazy. They did it. They survived it. Yeah. And it and, builds and in that sort of let's do it together moment you're talking about, which also bleeds into systemic issues of the day, the news of the day, the big things. The systemic issues. And then, of course, we're very aware of the environment because we swim in the sea. So we're, you know, thinking about, OK, how are my consumer choices affecting the Baltic Sea? You know, for example, if I if I buy fast fashion, do those, you know, do those chemicals or those clothes that are not going to be uh, possible to recycle, you know, is that going to affect the sea? So it, it takes you to a completely different level, I think, in terms of having a connection to nature. And one thing that I would say too is um, what's really important about the inclusivity is we have swimmers from the ages of about eight to 88. So it really, it's not something just like sauna, it's for everybody, it's not extreme. You don't need to have a speedo body or, a, or you know, there's a lot of people who go swimming early in the morning and the average age is about 70. And these are spry 70 year olds who are in great shape they're heading off to, you know, for a walk or for their gym class or a lecture at the university or whatever they're doing. And there, it's by no means something that is only for a select group of people. It's like well-being for everybody. And I think that is, again, going back to this idea of having conversations and community with people of all different backgrounds, of all different ages, uh, that is something that is really, really enriching. And and hard to find, you know, and hard to find in yeah. a world where we more naturally have been prone to our echo chambers and our devices that put us with people that, yeah. are, that are like us. And what a beautiful picture, people from 8 to 78 winter swimming together in a, on a brisk yeah. January Helsinki day, right? Like that's, yeah. that's so, I, I love it. Um, one thing you also are saying that I just, I think I need to highlight for people who are listening are probably like, they hear cold plunge and even the yeah. sounds of those words sound harsh. 
and you talk yeah. about this process so lightly. I'm just going to go for a dip, right? It just sounds <laughs> yeah. so lovely and like uh, uh, freeing. And I think for most folks, they don't think of it in those terms. Did you initially think of it in those terms or did that come with seeing the benefit from it and then coming to it later and being like, no, it is really just, it's a dip and it's lovely. That's a really good question. I think it's almost like, you know, when a parent says, oh, you should do this because it's good for you. Um, I definitely yeah, eat your did vegetables, not. right? <laughs> exactly. I definitely did not see the benefits. I really went to try it just because I thought I should, you know, more uh, uh, kind of as a, you know, the responsibility of a journalist, of a storyteller, of somebody living in another culture. And, and then when I tried it, I was like shocked that I felt so good afterwards. Like I really thought this is going to be a one-off. You know, I was standing there in my bathing suit in the middle of winter thinking, this makes no sense whatsoever. Like, and how can these, all these people, there's like a whole bunch of people here. This was very many years before the pandemic. You know, there's all these people waiting to go and do this. And, and then I tried it and I have to say, it did take several months before I was able to actually go into the water and like swim a little, you know, 30 second loop. I mean, in the beginning, it was literally like, ah, <laughs> you know, like go down the stairs, come right up, you know, shoot up like an arrow onto the dock. Uh, so it was definitely a process, but I think it's like the power of habit. When you realize you can do something that not only makes you feel really good, like your, you know, boosts your, your mental and your physical health, but also that you you overcome you know the part of you that just wants to pull the covers over your head, um, you get so you get so used to it, and it's like this really easy organic way um, to you know. And then you also know that the regulars will be there at a certain time. So if you don't go, then your friends won't be there, right? So you'll have to dip alone. So there's this. It is this, it is harder to dip alone, right? It's it's easier it's when totally you have totally harder. Yeah. And then, you know, you can complain or discuss, you know, the weather, the water, the wind, the, you know, whatever. And, um, and it just becomes this, this way of life. And, and it does become easy because as so many swimmers say to me, you know, and I completely subscribe to this, if I don't go for a dip, I'm just, the day just does not go as well. And, uh, I won't. There's a saying in Finnish, which is rather rude, but I'll, I'll politely translate it uh, as to basically saying um, being in a bad mood is water soluble. And the idea is that essentially <laughs> when you go for your dip, you get rid of all of your kind of irritation and crankiness and stress and all those other things. And you become a little more pleasant. I Absolutely love that. And I've never heard that. Uh, can you say that in proper Finnish? What would that sound I don't know like? if I want to, because it's a really, it's, it's actually, it's a really, it's a, well, I mean, it's a really common swear word in Finnish, but it sounds really awful in other languages because it refers to the female anatomy. I mean, I can say it if you want. Well, we'll let, we'll let people you look want... it up if they need to, but Okay, bad I mean, I can say it if you want. Bad feelings <laughs> are water soluble. Is that right? Is that the sort of yeah. nice version of translating that? The nice version, yeah. It's like basically being really pissed off and cranky is water soluble. Yeah, I uh, I haven't come up with a nice translation for it yet, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh I love all this talk about the cold. I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who sort of embraces it and enjoys it. And yet, I want to talk about the, the heat too, the warmth, right? And some people see yeah. that as a balm on the cold. Some people see that also mm -hmm. as a challenge, right? Of like, oh my goodness, I'm putting my body into this room that now is a 180, 190, 200 degrees Fahrenheit or you know, 90 C, 100 C. Uh, yeah. talk a little bit about how that has impacted your life in terms of sauna culture, maybe woven into mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you said, Hey, we're going to go dip. And then sometimes we go sauna afterwards. Yeah. And that again is something that I think if I hadn't taken up winter swimming, 
I don't think my appreciation for sauna or sauna, as they say in Finnish, would have grown so quickly and so intensely. And I think it's partly because it's the, the absolute perfect pairing on a cold winter night, for example. Uh, you can do it in the morning too, but say on an evening, you'll go for a dip and then you'll go in the sauna and then you'll go for another dip and you'll go into the sauna and maybe spend, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes in the sauna. And the sauna is on a good evening at our swimming club, for example, it's like a campfire. You know, there's, you see your friends, you have conversations about everything from, you know, where the best skiing tracks are to world politics to whatever, anything. And then you go and you have your dip and you, you get nice and cold and icy and it almost feels better because you know you're going to be able to go and warm up in the hot sauna. And then, of course, the sauna, the steam sets off, you know, a whole group of physiological, you know, you feel relaxed, you feel calm, your muscles get nice and soft and, and relaxed. You sweat out all the toxins and all the things that are bothering you. I mean, I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm, you're preaching to the choir here. I would sure yeah. <laughs> agree that it is the perfect pairing on a cold winter night. And I think you paint a good picture of it, right? That it is a space for community. It is a space for healing. It is a space for wellness. And yet folks have sort of I would say seldom experienced quality in reference to that. I often liken it to, you know, bad food. People have, you know, often been served the McDonald's version of sauna or sauna. Yeah. And there's like, oh, I don't really like that. Um, but that there's, ne they've never been welcomed in. They've never been given an introduction to it. How do you just like winter swimming, of getting somebody to try that for the first time? Mm -hmm. What have you seen for sauna that works? for getting somebody yeah. to, to taste the authentic Finnish cuisine and cultural gift that is sauna? How do you start somebody there? I think one of the main things is to go to a really good public sauna. So one that's big, but also visually quite spectacular. Um, I think big spacious saunas uh, tend to be a good place to start because a small sauna for somebody who's feeling you know, maybe a little claustrophobic, a little unsure, and maybe they also have some issues, um, you know, like they don't want to be naked, which is how a good Finnish sauna is, is done. Naked, men and women go separately. Um, in a big sauna, in a public pool, you know, some people in some places you can keep your swimming suit on or you can wrap a towel around yourself. And I think that really helps uh, first timers who are feeling, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, a little unsure, and then you have a nice, beautiful space, uh, maybe with a window overlooking the sea. And it makes it, it's like sauna 101 or <laughs> kind of introductory sauna. And then they can focus on, you know, in proper sauna etiquette, people ask before they pour water on the, uh, on the stones, the rocks uh, for lolu, which is the steam that comes up. And it's a much easier way to try out the experience and then you can go from there because I think like many things in life if your first experience is you know too hot too small <laughs> too naked <laughs> um, that can really put people off and they'll think oh this is not for me and this is this is the way this thing is yeah. and, and it, yeah and it, I think that that's such a great picture of you know similar to food that you've never tasted, you're going to need to know what's in it. What's the flavors? What am I, what am I putting yeah. into my body or putting myself through as an experience? You know, I'm a, I love me some good coffee, right? But it, for yeah. some folks, if you don't know, it's, I, I started drinking coffee later in life when I had it with chocolate cake and I was like, wait, these things together, they're amazing. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, exactly. That, that little moment of inviting people into the story of what's happening to them and also what are they a part of. And in Duluth and in our locations where we're inviting people to experience sauna, that, that's, that's part of the goal is let's introduce you to this thing at the highest level. You maybe have grown up in this space and know everything great. Maybe you're geeking out about the wellness benefits. 
let's go there with you. Maybe you want to mm-hmm. hear the cultural heritage. Wonderful. But let's give you this experience that sets the table for you to enjoy more and in new ways and again and again. Um, and I think you just do a, such a good job of that in, in, in all the work in, in multiple areas here. <laughs> so thanks for being one of our champions. Thanks for being one of those people that are progressing yeah. sound and culture forward to, to the world. You know, not just to little small parts of northern Minnesota and to Finland. So your your work here, Kazia, is so helpful. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and I go ahead. No, I was going to say I think it's the same thing. Uh, everybody should have a friend or an experienced swimmer to take them winter swimming for the first time. And I think it's the same thing with sauna. If you're not familiar with it, having somebody take you gently and explain and show and tell you what it's all about and the history and all of those things make such a huge difference. Well, I think we need to make some time together to swim and sauna together at some point. Uh, I, you know, Definitely. if you find yourself <laughs> in North America, you always have an invitation to join us here on the Great Lake. We have a lot of cold water, so you wouldn't be afraid of that. Super. And next time I'm, <laughs> next time I'm over in Finland, I, I, I think I better come find you and we better go take a dip, a nice, easy, Definitely. cold water dip. Um, Katya, where should folks, I, I'm just really thankful for your time today. Where should folks find you if they're interested in all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Where do they go to find your work and follow along? I think the best place is Instagram because that's where I try to post, uh, all the information and pictures, pictures of saunas and swimming and Helsinki and Finland and Sisu and information about, uh, my books and events and stuff like that. So it's just at my name, Katya Panzar, um, and Instagram. Wonderful. Well, we will share links to that, and we will be sharing this right on Instagram. You'll probably see some tags of that coming up really soon. And uh, everybody who is listening, I do want to encourage you, uh, go find Katya's work, Everyday Sisu, the newest book that just came out, and then The Finish Way, you know, the one that for me, again, remains like the Bible around all of this stuff. Uh, we actually, we, we train sound entrepreneurs who are launching sound of businesses all over North America. And this is required reading. This is the thing. When they join the cohort, we send them a copy of this book and some great tea and, you know, a, a sweatshirt and sort of like, hey, you're a part of a community now. And this is the required reading as they go. So Thank you so much, Katya. It's been amazing and super fun to have you here on Sound of Culture. And until we go winter swimming together, we'll see you soon, okay? Thank you. It's been my pleasure. All right. Bye, you guys. From Helsinki to Minnesota, to all over North America and all over the world. That is a great conversation from Katya Panzer. Uh, Sarah, as you sort of hear that, what are the sort of next steps people got to do as they've listened to what, to what Katya is really pointing us forward towards? Yeah. I mean, first things first, go read her books. Uh, The Finish Way changed my life a couple of years ago and I haven't gotten to read Sisu yet, but I'm on it. I am on it. It just Uh, came out. I mean, we're recording this (laughs) days after it came on the shelf. So it's out. We got a couple copies over there. I'll take one home. Yep. Um, Otherwise, just get in some cold water. Jump in, Uh, guys. Challenge yourself. You can do it. It's only scary the first time. You got it. That's totally true. You guys, thank you for joining us. If this has been helpful, please listen to more. We got more coming every single week here and we have more on the feed right now we dropped a bunch as we're kicking off and launching share it with your friends write us a review head over to apple podcasts or spotify and write us a review and hit that subscribe button we would love to keep sharing these stories of sound of culture that is changing people's lives all over the world with you and with others until next time you guys